So hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me on this lovely Thursday morning on the last day of Coalesce. I hope the um, conference has been amazing for you all. And this morning, we're going to have a little bit of fun. Of course, we'll get to data orchestration and, and all of that stuff. Um, but really, we're going to talk about Survivor. This is a Survivor fan club over here. No, I'm just kidding. We'll, we'll talk about both. So to kick us off, um, There we go. Um, a little bit of my, about myself. Uh, my name is Sarah. I was previously leading the data engineering team at Perpe, doing everything from analytics to data platform. And I really wanted to start um, writing more and kind of talking about what I was doing. Um, and that really led me into my current role at Prefect, which is a workflow orchestration tool. And I do growth and marketing at Prefect. Now, we're all friends here, so I'll share some, some other tidbits about myself. Um, I really love analogies. I really, really do. So that's where the inspiration for this talk came from. And I also binge TV. I really do. And while I would have loved to have this whole talk be about Love Island instead of Survivor, I think that would have been a little too divisive. So we're going we're gonna to stick with Survivor. So how many of you have seen the show, watched the show, like in any capacity? OK, so, some hands, some hands. So I'm just going to make sure everyone's on the, on the same page here. So Survivor is a game of social science, and specifically failure, right? How do we communicate in bad situations? Now, with data teams, that's not that different, right? Data teams, everything is great until something fails. And that is exactly going to be what we're talking about, about failure recovery. So with Survivor, I think my clicker is, uh, there we go. So Survivor started in the year 2000. The premise really hasn't changed that much, right? In 23 years, premise stays the same. Um, Contestants, about 18 to 20 of them, often called castaways, um, are put on an island. And they're split up into two to three tribes that then compete uh, against each other. Now, they compete in challenges. And what happens when a tribe loses is the losing tribe goes to tribal council and someone is voted off. When it goes from 20 to about 11, 12 people, it gets into the individual phase, and the same premise, right? If you don't win the individual challenge, you risk being voted off. And that is when, right, when you lose, that is when people start scrambling. Uh, so what does scrambling look like? Tribal council is a test of trust. Do you have the correct picture of reality? How, is it true what people have told you? And multiple people probably told you different things. How do you trust your connections? And how do you trust what you have heard? One person does not have the correct picture of reality. And this person is blindsided and voted off. Now, it wouldn't be one of the greatest shows on, on television if there weren't any twists. And that twist is the final card that someone usually has to play, which is about secret immunity. That is the hidden immunity idol. Everyone is searching for it because what it allows you to do is if you play it at tribal council, then the votes cast against you will not count. So it basically saves you no matter how many people have voted for you, that tribal council. Now, there are two things that uh, you need to know about hidden immunity idols. The first is they're very hard to find. They can be inside trees. You might have to dig, right? They might, they might be in plain sight. They might not. But then, even when you get the hidden immunity, hidden immunity idol, you have to figure out what to do with it, right? Do you tell people? But then if you tell people, everyone knows you might become a target. People might want to vote you off, even though you have it. Or do you not tell people, but then you have to lie. You have to figure out what to do with this information and make sure that you don't get caught with that information that you are not telling people. Now, one caveat here is on Survivor, there can be a lot of finger pointing, right? And I do want to make it very clear that 
This is in no way advocating for finger pointing on data teams. This is precisely the opposite of how to avoid that exact situation. Now, there is finger pointing from not resolving failure productively, right? You fail, a tribe fails, uh, there is, you, you go against each other. Now, right, there's a lot of game theory and survivor that I could go into, which is quite interesting. Strongly encourage everyone to look it up, but we are at an analytics engineering conference, not a survivor meetup. So let me kind of move, move on from that, right? How does that relate to data teams? I'm sure many people, if not everyone, has been woken up right, to a Slack message with some red bar, and you're like, holy crap, there's a failure. What do I do with this information? If it's a one-off script, right, you probably won't even get this message because it's not going to be important enough for you to even receive an alert. But the failure becomes a problem when there are many people involved, when there are upstream dependencies, downstream dependencies. Right, now, I don't want to be too hand-wavy about this, so let's get more specific. Consider you're at an e-commerce company, and one of, the pro one of the daily processes that you have to do is reconcile refunds from the previous day or previous few days. Now, you maybe didn't even see this Slack message, and you were beat by another Slack message from your finance team saying, well, why, why do my refund reconciliation reports look oddly like two days ago? Right? There's, some, there's something up here. And so that triggers you to go into debugging mode. And that debugging mode is figuring out what really happened. Right? What is the correct picture of reality? You could take it from the finance team, and that's their story. You could start looking at downstream data sets, upstream data sets. Right? There's a lot of different places that you could look, a lot of stories that you could be told. They are orchestrated and tied together. But let's say, right, you see, you log into wherever your data sets are run, wherever your processes are run, and you see two red bars. And you're like, great, maybe one of these ties to that Slack message that I received. Right, so let's, let's resolve this mystery together. We're going to go down, down this rabbit hole for, for, for a little bit. Refund reconciliation, OK? Let's make it even more real. Consists of a few steps. So first. The, uh, a report, maybe running some DBT models, is gener generated for the commerce team. The commerce team then has a manual process. Maybe it's looking up certain invoices. Maybe it's talking to customers about what their refunds entail. And that process might take 10 minutes or two hours. Right? That could vary uh, day to day, depending on the types of refunds, sizes of refunds. Next, after they're done with that, the data is pulled into the warehouse. Some transformations are run. The finance team gets their uh, report. And the product recommendation model, right? We would think that you don't want to recommend products to new users that have a high rate of refunds or a high prediction of a refund rate. And so we want to retrain that model to make sure that we don't do that. Now, if we recall here, the conversation started at the very end of this process, right, with the finance team, the reports. This is the last step. So going, going back here, right, we see these two red bars. We can't just go to your accounting lead and say, oh yeah, here it is, right? That doesn't mean much to them. So we have to go one step further, right? There are many different potential failures. Now, right, stick with me here. So survivor idols, I said they could be hard to find. That's one possibility. But if you know where to look, they could actually be right in front of you. And that is exactly similar to logs, right? There are a lot of different logs, whether it's in DBT Cloud, whether it's in your CDC service writing to your warehouse, whether it's in ML Flow and your ML models, your BI layer. You could look in a lot of different places. But the question is, right, where do you look? What actually has to do with refunds? Now, right, recall, right, we talked about these, these two red bars. And um, they could, there's a Docker container somewhere running. Uh, there are model logs. Where is this idle, right? This idle being wire reports failed. Now, let me go on a little bit of an aside. Things are never as they seem 
in Survivor. So one thing that some contestants have done is create fake idols. So if you find the idol and you want to make someone believe that someone else has it, you keep the idol, but you maybe take some string and move some of the beads that you've collected because you have nothing to do in Fiji um, besides do something like this, and you create a fake idol, right? Or if you don't have an idol, you make people think that you have an idol, right? Again. Let's recall, we're not tricking our data coworkers here. The, our coworkers are not these fake idols. These are your logs, right? Your logs are your fake idols. You can't tell if the log that you're looking at or the failure message that you're looking at is relevant to the situation that you're debugging unless you actually have the real one, right? You don't know until you actually figure it out and look backwards. It's not about finding one idol or one error. Right? We want to confirm we have the correct picture of reality. So we're going to go back to these error bars. Right? So we saw our DBT cloud job, and we looked into it, and it was totally unrelated. Maybe it was something around marketing attribution, because the marketing team has so many demands, and that's always very difficult. And we'll just deal with that later. Right? That's going to be less, less relevant to our situation. Now, you will then look at the other error, right? and you understand it. And you get excited because you're like, I get this now. It's the worker, right? We see that our flow run, the worker, it's something with the worker. You know what's going on. It's always the worker. This is always the error. But then you start doubting yourself because the financial reports, well, they don't, they don't run in Docker. How, how is this related, right? And today, like the financial reports ran. It couldn't be the worker. The data in them was just wrong. So then we're a little bit back to square one. Now in Survivor, oftentimes what happens is people, um, right, right, we're, we're all deep in this together here. Just like in Survivor, all of these castaways, they're deep in this together, but they get pulled aside for a conversation. In Survivor, usually this happens when Someone in your alliance hears something that someone wants you voted out and you don't know. And so what usually results from these conversations is a shattered picture of reality. Someone, after such conversation, understands that they did not have the correct picture of reality. Now at work, a lot of these side conversations, right, we consider them to be like, water cooler conversations. Now maybe they happen more over Slack, over a metaphorical water cooler. Now Survivor is an individual game. Work is not quite as cutthroat, but the water cooler conversations and these side conversations are still very relevant. So let's imagine here that you have a close friend in the data engineering department. Her name is Holly. Okay? Holly starts talking to you and just purely venting about the QuickBooks API that and you forgot, right? You remember in this conversation that Fivetran pulls data from QuickBooks and writes it into the data warehouse. She's telling you about how the QuickBooks API, it's so brittle because the keys have to be rotated and sometimes they have to be rotated after a week, sometimes they have to be rotated after two months and it's so annoying because she can't figure it out and then your gears start to turn. The job for the financial reports joins on QuickBooks data, and the QuickBooks API is down, and so now you're starting to put everything together, right? This is why the refunds report didn't have all the complete information. Now, why didn't you find this earlier is the question. Fivetran was on an island, right? It's not you in Fiji on vacation, otherwise you wouldn't be dealing with this mess. It's, it's, it was the Fivetran job that was not connected to everything else, and there's no way for you to have known that it was connected unless you had, unless you dug either very, very deep or you had institutional knowledge and just some sort of information that this was happening. Now, this is not scalable because you just forgot, right? This is a very human problem, and we want to automate away from this. This is very ineffective. Now, what could have prevented this, right? Communication. You happen to have communication with your coworker, but, but what if, 
right? In, in tribal council, there's no unity, right? It's the same thing. You communicate with people, and then that's how you figure out what is going on. But if the communication actually happens and starts at tribal council, that means things are already bad. People start to scramble. They talk in a frenzy. They have side conversations. And it either um, intentionally or unintentionally, many different things are revealed. So if, if you know me at all, one of the things that I say a lot of the time is, OK, so what does this actually mean? Like, what are we actually trying to say? So what am I actually talking about here, right? We've talked about some failures. We've talked about survivor. So what am I actually saying? Encode your dependencies in a central place. What that starts with is making sure all your workflows are complete and coordinated from start to finish. So if your workflow has an upstream dependency that needs orchestration, right? you want to encode that together. So when you go to start debugging, you know all the different pieces at play. When you're encoding these dependencies, it's not just documentation. It's in code. It's versioned, and they change as your workflow changes. Having this in a central place allows you to not rely on purely human communication and institutional knowledge to really understand and debug. Now, I do by centralization, I do not mean running everything on the same infrastructure. What I do mean is within your workflows and within your jobs, drawing lines using code through the different pieces. You could have your DBT cloud jobs running. That's totally fine. You could have your that, that product recommendation model running in ECS, that is totally fine. But you want all of that to be connected in some way so that no matter if it's you or a coworker who might not have that institutional knowledge can debug accordingly. What about data tests, right? DB, their DBT tests, those are all very important. However, they are not the whole story. The failure is more than data tests. You can think about the world in two different ways. The first is data as assets, and the second is data as a result of processes. Now, data in integrity, you want your data to be correct, and you have certain expectations of your data. But that is not the full picture, because data runs on infrastructure. Data comes from models. Data gets sent to models. Data might come from external tools. Data might be sent to external tools. The data could be correct, but it could not be in the place that you need it to be. Right, such as the financial reports, for example. And that's where your stakeholders notice. If your test fails, you want to act on those failures. Doing that automatically is the only scalable way to do that. So again, you don't rely on that human communication to respond to failures. Data does not live in a vacuum. You could think of this as data coming from your workflows, right? Your workflows emit certain pieces of data that allow you to respond, right? At, Pre at Prefect, if, if anyone um, has stopped by our booth, something that you might have heard one of us say is, well, you don't just log into your workflow, your orchestrator dashboard, and say, yeah, my workflows are doing great today. Let me just continue looking at my dashboard. You're usually in there because you're trying to figure out what went wrong. And here, the failures mean something in context, and you want to understand that entire context in one place. This is um, a, a screenshot from the, the new dashboard that we released in, in, in Prefect. And really, this is just more uh, of an illustrative point of what it might look like to have all your information in the same place, whether it's your data test, whether it's the status of your infrastructure. And those red bars, right? those two red bars, they are in context and not just segmented in one place where you have to read an error, and then you're trying to go somewhere else to actually debug the, the entire workflow. Now, I mentioned context, right? Who needs to get this context? Your business stakeholders. Data teams produce reports. They produce processes. They send data to external tools that are used by other teams. So everyone needs to be inside of this triaging process and explicit, explicitly communicated to when things fail so that they build trust within your team. You're looping, you have to loop in people not only in Slack, right? If you just send a Slack error message, though, yeah, this null test failed. 
Again, that might not mean much outside of the analytics team, for example, to your accounting lead, to your marketing lead, whoever it might be. Just like for us, the Docker worker example that I mentioned, right? that might not mean much outside of the data engineering team. This really comes down to process and about uh, communication, and this is where the uh, human element does come in. Now, I would be remiss if I did not mention Survivor just one last time, because it's been a little bit, it's been a little while. The motto of Survivor is outwit, outplay, and outlast, right? So let's break that down one by one. Outplay, in Survivor that's doing challenges, right? That's competing, competing against each other and winning. And in data, that's doing your job. That is building, that is writing good code, that is building, building good pipelines. Outwit. That is the social part of the game. That's where you're talking to people, trying to understand what is reality. And in data, that's talking to people and understanding your dependencies, both the human ones with your stakeholders and your encoded dependencies. Data teams can learn from Survivor, but there's one more element here, the outlast. In Survivor, this means being the person that is the last one standing, the strong one, the tactful one. Now, this is where I have to throw in the towel a little bit because this is where this analogy falls apart. Data teams should not compete. Our goal is not to build the best pipeline or build the most beautiful model because we all know that sometimes when we build those models and they're beautiful, we're very proud of them. But the goal is for data teams to deliver business value. And every time something fails and every minute that you spend debugging, you are not delivering that business value. That's why communication, both with people and in a coded way, is extremely important. And now, that is the end. Thank you, everyone, for attending the talk. Uh, we hope you check out Prefect. Um, and it, also, if you stop by our booth later today, we will be, uh, right after this, we will be announcing we are giving an, away an iPhone 15. Is that true, an iPhone 15? So please do stop by our booth and learn more. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.